and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Sleep apnea is a common disorder that causes pauses in breathing or shallow breaths during sleep. CPAP and BiPAP machines are used to keep the throat open during periods of sleep. Today we will discuss care coordination with children using a CPAP BiPAP machine. And we will also review the new process for being reimbursed for these machines from the Alabama Medicaid Agency. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Care Coordination with Children Using a CPAP BiPAP Machine, an update for ADPH social workers. Our objectives today are to understand how a CPAP BiPAP machine functions to keep airways open during sleep. Understand why ADPH social workers need to know the new policies related to clients who use CPAP and BiPAP machines. Describe the role of the ADPH care coordinators and understand the new documentation and how to enter data in ACORN. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email our faculty presenter during the live broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation for this program are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for social workers for this program. The credit hours will be determined after the training is complete. We will send an email to all registered participants with the amount of credit hours when it is available. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. Instructions on how to do this can be found at the bottom of the sign-in sheet. There is no financial relationship between the planners of this program and the speakers. There is also no commercial support for this program. ADPH does not endorse any product that may be displayed in conjunction with any activity that might be demonstrated, nor will the department discuss any off-label use of products. My name is Meredith Adams, and I'm the Director of Social Work for the Bureau of Family Health Services with the Alabama Department of Public Health. I would like to introduce our faculty presenter today, Jackson Register, with Phillips Healthcare in Birmingham. Welcome, and Jackson, thank you again so much for coming today. We really appreciate your help with this. Thank you for having me. So Jackson today is going to go over some different CPAP and BiPAP machines with you, but I wanted to give you a brief overview just to start out with uh, about kind of what the, the, the process we are going to be doing is. First, we might need to know what is CPAP and BiPAP? What does that stand for? Well, the CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. BiPAP stands for biphasic positive airway pressure. Fortunately, you're not going to have to know exactly what that means or how it works, but we're just going to give you some general information about that today so that when you're in the home with these families, you'll have kind of a heads up on it. But you do not have to understand exactly what those terms mean or how it all works. These, different, these two types of machines are used to keep the throat open during the night while someone is sleeping. They weigh about five pounds and can fit on a bedside table. The, there's a face mask with these machines and it covers the nose and has tubing to connect to the device. And we're going to show you some of those. Um, my husband wears one at night, so you're going to hear some, some stories about my husband um, while we're going through training today. And um, he told me this morning, he said, are you going to tell him I'm a spaceman? I was like, well, I don't know if we'll go that far, but the tube kind of goes back over the head. So it is kind of like a spacesuit sometimes when you're wearing this machine. And uh, I told him I was going to be talking about him today. And he said, well, are you going to give stories and everything? I said, yes, I'm going to give stories. And he said, well, tell him this and tell him that. And I said, you realize that everything you're telling me is like putting this on our child. We have a five and a half year old. And I said, can you imagine trying to get this machine to work on our child? which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but the machine is going to supply a steady stream of air through the tubes, and it applies sufficient air pressure to prevent tissues in the airway from collapsing during sleep when a person inhales. Uh, before uh, Gavin, my husband, went on his machine, I can remember laying there in the bed, and when he would snore, he would stop breathing. And I can remember counting the seconds 
for to when he would start breathing again. So it can be pretty scary to, to sleep next to someone that's not breathing during the night. So um, the machine is actually wonderful because I sleep much better now because he he's not snoring anymore. Um, the CPAP BiPAP therapy is covered for children to the age of 21, but they have to meet medical criteria. Again, you do not have to determine those medical criteria. That is going to be done before you get the referral on the patient. But the child does have to have an EPSDT screening. They do have to go through a sleep study, which that can be pretty intense and scary for the child as well. Uh, they have to be hooked up to lots of different monitors and probes, and they have all those little spots where they have the machines checking their heart rate and their breathing rate. So the sleep study could be scary for the child to go through as well. Uh, patients are required to use these devices will have a form of sleep apnea, which can be caused by various types of issues. So that's just some general information uh, about, about the machines, just some background. And I'm going to turn this over to Jackson now because he knows way more about the machines than I do. And he's going to go over how the machine works. Uh, there's different types of masks that the children could be fitted for, so we're going to take a look at those. There's instructions that the caregivers are going to have to have. They're going to need to know how to clean the machines. And there's also a data transmission that happens back to the DME company. You are not going to be responsible for tracking the compliance of the child. That is the responsibility of the DME company, and the machine does that for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Jackson, and he's going to give us an overview. Thank so, you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Jackson, registered, like uh, Meredith stated, with Philips Respironics. We are a manufacturer of sleep and home respiratory products. What I would like to talk to you about today is the... CPAP, the BiPAP, and other technologies that are available for you to, to treat these patients. Um, we have today out here on the table for us is our auto CPAP device. Most of the children that I see that are using devices today are on auto CPAP, and I'll explain that a little bit in greater detail. You have CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, as Meredith stated earlier, so that's one pressure whether you inhale or exhale, same constant pressure all the time. We developed a technology called C-Flex. C-Flex is relief on the expiratory side of the breath. So what happens, as you said, with continuous positive airway pressure, one pressure all the time. Mm -hmm. Like driving down the highway at 55, 60 miles per hour and sticking your head out the window and not being able to, to catch your breath. It can feel like that at times for patients. So what we did with C-Flex is we determined that at the point that a patient begins to exhale, at the very beginning of exhalation is what is so important with C-Flex, and it delivers relief at that point in time. However, when you're dropping pressure on exhalation, you must make sure that you're back up to set pressure, which is the prescribed pressure that the doctor or the sleep lab determined was most optimal to keep the patient's airway splinted. And if you're not back to uh, set pressure by end exhalation, you may be comfortable, but you're not therapeutic. And I think that's something that you may hear a lot with, with sleep therapy is do they accept it, do they tolerate it, and do they respond to it? Because they may accept the therapy, they may go home and use it, they may tolerate the therapy, they're getting the hours of usage for compliance, but are they responding to the therapy? Are they actually getting what they, the device was intended to do to give them a better quality of life, to get them the rest that they need, to give them the proper oxygenation and things that they would need at night? So we need to make sure you know, that, that we are actually delivering that optimal therapy. I work a lot with physicians that are at Children's Hospital. They have chosen, in most cases, it's literally 100% auto CPAP, okay? We've talked about CPAP, one pressure, continuous positive airway pressure all the time, okay? So if it's, and most of that varies from four to 20 centimeters of water pressure. So it's, they determine what is the optimal pressure to splint that airway. Well, then we talked about C-Flex, which is relief. Well, when you talk about auto CPAP, so a physician determines that 10 centimeters of water pressure is the optimal pressure to keep the airway splitted. Well, what auto CPAP would do is with different stages of sleep, you may need more or you may need less pressure. The goal of an auto CPAP is to be at the lowest mean airway pressure possible while taking care of the patient's events. So you may be at 10 centimeters, you know, in the middle of the night, but as you get into REM sleep, which is our deep dream sleep, then you may need more pressure. Okay, 
so and the device is going to respond accordingly to that. But when you fall out of REM sleep, you may need less pressure, and the device is going to respond according to, to that. So therefore, it's again, it's more optimal throughout the, the, the patient's whole time frame of that night, and we tend to see a little bit better compliance from that. And we talked about, I know Meredith mentioned earlier some of the compliance that gets back from the DME provider. Um, on the device, we have a couple of different options available to, to get that compliance back to a DME and then ultimately back to the physician who will be treating that patient. We have a wireless modem option. So wireless modem would be just much like any other wireless technology. We use Verizon for that. And it's sending a signal out to the device and transmitting that back to an application that we call Encore Anywhere, giving the physician, again, not only is the patient using that device, but is the patient responding and, and actually you know, tolerating and responding, and meaning that are, they, are we treating the obstructive apneas? Okay, so an apnea being 80% reduction in flow for 10 seconds or greater. Are we treating the hypopneas? Okay, a hypopnea being 40% reduction in flow for 10 seconds or greater. And you also have patients that will have neurological related issues that will cause central sleep apnea, maybe a heart failure related issue and basically the body shuts down, there's no airway obstruction, however, the brain is not sending the signal to breathe at that particular point in time. And what you want to do with CPAP is you do not want to respond to a central event. You want to note that on a report and be able to provide that back to the doctor because the doctor may make a different decision. It may be a whole different therapy that, we may, we'll, that we'll talk about here in a little while. So we're moving them from one technology over to the next based off that report. You may see patients that have heart failure related issues and you may be familiar with the terminology Shane Stokes respiration and or periodic breathing. Patients that have heart failure will, will, do, will show you what's it's a waxing and waning breathing pattern. So you'll get normal flow and then you'll get some big peaks and then you'll watch it drop back off and then you'll get big peaks. And it's the heart failure related issues that could be causing those centrals to occur but also people will have centrals that emerge just based off CPAP therapy in general. Their body's used to high levels of CO2 retention because of the obstructed airway. When the CPAP comes in and blows that off, the body says, hold on a minute, what happened to all that high CO2? I'm getting oxygen, which we want now, and the body says, wait a minute, my chemoreceptors are off. I'm going to show hypoventilation and I'll throw central events. Now, I will tell you, in most cases, those chemoreceptors will reset themselves, and the physicians know that. So you give the patient sometimes, in that particular case, 30 days, and you'll see that the CPAP normally will, will reset that, and, and the body will get that normal oxygen CO2 delivery that they, that they should have. Okay, so getting information back to the DME provider. One wireless modem coming directly to it. You can also take the wireless modem off of the device, and there's also a little uh, an SD card. I will tell you SD cards are the most common uh, practice due to the economics of the wireless transmission, and, and there, is, there are fees associated with that. So what you would see is an SD card taken into the physician's practice in most cases, and I can speak you know, from, from a children's hospital in Birmingham standpoint. They have clinic, obviously, every so often. And they're bringing, the patients are bringing these in and they are downloading that to find out, again, are we treating the apneas, are we treating the hypopneas, are we treating periodic breathing, or, or the mass, is the mass leaking, um, are they getting the proper humidification and things that they'll need. So all of that information is available on, on one of the reports that comes from the card. Now, if you talk to a patient and a patient says, I've lost my card. How am I going to get that data back? I don't have a wireless modem. I don't have other options. How am I going to get that data back? Well, the device does have onboard memory, okay? So if a card is not no longer in the machine, you could take a card, put it into the device, and it would read that data back, back to the card. So all information is not lost. It may even be a good idea in a lot of cases to advise the patient if they're going to the to clinic to see the physician to go ahead and take the device as well, just in case they show up, maybe a card's not there, or if there's anything maybe the physician needs to adjust, it's just a safety mechanism so you don't have to make, they don't have to make additional trips. 
So the patient should take the machine in when they're going to clinic or to see the doctor. Yes. The whole, and it, it doesn't weigh very much. It doesn't weigh very much. It's a five pound. It, it's got a, uh, it's it's a got small a carrying, bag. carrying bag with a strap over the shoulder. It's, mm -hmm. um, but they, it, it's not a lot of trouble to do that. I just say that's a safety mechanism because the last thing you want to do is drive in, have a patient drive in 30, 40 miles out, not have the card, and the physician can't really make any determinations without that card. So if we've got the device, we should be able to, to obtain that data, okay? And they use a system uh, with, with us called Encore Anywhere, and they, the physicians have, so it's all HIPAA you know, compliant, all the data is protected, especially if it's coming from a wireless modem, and it transmits back into that physician with his own specific lo login and password for that patient. So a DME provider connects that physician electronically in the Encore system. To that. If they download that SD card at the DME practice, then that will also show in the Encore system for the physician as well. So it's, there's, there's several different mechanisms to, to be able to do that. Okay, so that's, that's as far as data transmission is concerned. Now, with the device, you have the actual, what we would call the blower, and you would have what we would call the humidifier, okay? They are always sent in what we would call a core package. So they are sent together. We have very, very, very poor compliance with patients that do not have humidification. A lot of times your normal drying and moisturizing agents, once you're delivering that positive pressure, is no longer there. So you want to add the, the warm humidification to that as well. It's just drastically, study after study has shown how much that has improved compliance. However, with that being said, a lot of times you've got really cold air in a, maybe in, in the room that the individual is sleeping in, and you've got warm air coming out of the device. Cold air, warm air meet, we get condensation, and it begins to rain outside. So when you get condensation in your tubing and you start feeling like you're snorkeling at night, which is not what we're looking for, then we need to find a way to eliminate the, the snorkel at night. What we would do with that is we've built in what's called System 1 humidity control. Okay. So what does System 1 humidity control actually do? There's settings on the device, and, and we'll try to show you those today, for anywhere from, from 1 to 5, 5 being the highest heat output, 1 being the lowest heat output. I am a big proponent of moving that all the way up to 5 because of the humidity control. It says, I want to see what the temperature is in the room, and I want to see what the relative humidity is in the room. If I keep pumping out heat in this particular based off, hey, a 62 degree, 63, 64 degree room, whatever it may be, which that's pretty cold. But if, if I do, then I am going to cause rain out. So it's going to stop delivering the heat at some particular point in time because it says, hey, I can deliver heat. I can keep you from being dried out, but you're going to be snorkeling once again, and that's what we're trying to, to eliminate. So we will, but, but at five, it's going to hit about a 95% heat output and is also going to protect that condensation and rain out from occurring. There are some other modes that are available there too. We will occasionally get a patient that will advise that they're still not experiencing enough heat, so they're still drying out. And there are some methodologies, and I think you could talk to your various DME providers about it. It's classic humidification and it does not have as much, it doesn't really have rain out control, the, the snorkeling effect that we were talking about earlier. It says, you know what, I'm going to give you heat and I'm not going to worry about what else is going on, on in your environment. So there is an, if you get a patient that calls back after, you know, they've, they've been on the device, rain out's not really necessarily a problem, they may want to switch over to that classical mode. And quite frankly, you could insulate the tube, which is the tube that, you know, connected to the device and to the mask, just literally underneath your covers. Or there are even two tube sleeves that would go over the top of those that you could help do that, and that's going to protect from some of that as well. So I want to give you a couple of options there. Now, as far as cleaning and maintaining you know, this device, especially the humidifier, um, here in the state of Alabama, I like to, I think most people understand when we say take a look underneath the hood. We say <laughs> take a look underneath the hood, you lift the, the latch right on the, on the humidifier side, all the way to the hood is completely up. When the hood is completely up, you reach in there and pull the water chamber out, okay? The water chamber has a little latch here in the back that a patient, and they will have a hard time finding this. It, it, it's not that hard, but you can imagine riding a bike wasn't, was hard the first time you ever did it. You reach in there and you find the clip, you just 
depress the clip and pull the lid off of the, humid, the, the water chamber, okay? There is a fill line in the water chamber, so it tells you exactly where they need to fill that up. And you also want to clean this kind of with a, a, a vinegar type solution, warm water vinegar solution. Occasionally you may get calcium deposit buildup here in the very bottom of it, and you want them to use distilled water if at all, all possible in that device, okay? If you were to pour water up above the, the outlet port here, then it could pour back out onto someone's nightstand, so that is why you want to make sure that you do fill, have them fill that to the max line. It's got little clips on the back, so if you will just line those clips back up and then just hear the humidity water chamber click back on, you will have that back in place. How often do the families have to refill that? On a daily basis. Daily? On a daily basis, because you just, it would be like leaving this, this cup of water out, you know, for a, for a mm -hmm. week or two at your home, you wouldn't do it because you would begin to see things build up, you know, in in the glass. So we try to go ahead and advise them to, to clean that out on a daily basis and uh, fill that. So if the family's not putting water in the chamber, then they could be getting all this air blowing at them that could be drying them out, which could be a reason why they're not using the machine. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. And you will, you will see a lot of that go on with the devices that early on patients that or, or you're used to maybe breathing through your mouth, now you're breathing through your nose mm -hmm. because you had the obstruction, and then the humidification is much needed to, to get that back. And distilled and water is recommended so that you don't have the calcium deposits. That is correct. So that's something else that we need to educate our patients on is that it needs to be distilled water and not just tap water. That is correct. That is correct. Pull this back up real quick. The, um, so we, we talked about taking, ta undoing the top, putting that back on, filling, putting back in the machine. Now going back in the machine, it, it only goes one way with the long end. So if a patient calls and they are trying to put it in backwards, which, which can happen, then you know, just make sure that the long end points in and it will seat properly in the device. Now also, we have something in, inside the device here called dry box, it's called the dry box technology, okay? Why would we put something called dry box technology in there? Well, patients will put these in the bag, they'll go to clinic, and they will have water left in the water chamber a lot. So water and electronics usually do not mix very well, and what would happen is they would carry those and water would come back to the, to the blower side of things, and then the patients would have issues with their device. So what that dry box does is it, it trap catches any water that may go back into the device and then when they turn the blower back on it flushes the dry box out so you don't have water sitting in that. We were able to eliminate a lot of issues of devices coming back with problems due to water ingress by adding that. It's not something that you'll have to talk too much about but I just want you to know. And occasionally there are little rings inside of these things that, that seat to the uh, water chamber if the device is making a very loud noise or anything like that, maybe the ring has come back. Just make sure that they've got all the rings connected or lead them to their DMA provider to make sure that they've got that. Okay? If a patient decides they do not want to travel for whatever reason with their humidifier, it's not necessary if they're not experiencing any issues, okay, with, with humidification. So there is a latch on the right side of the humidifier that if you'll just slide, it'll pop off and you've got nothing but your little device. So we just went from five pounds to two and a half pounds. Same thing that you could say to if they wanted to go to clinic. Probably don't necessarily need the humidifier. Uh, you may not want to go there, keep everything together if at all possible, but they could take it and the device would work just fine without the uh, humidifier attached. And then it just makes, there's a little port on this side. You can see the, the uh, electrical component to connect the humidifier there. You just make that back up and it snaps right back together. So very easy as far as, um, as, far as getting those two, two things back together. Um, so then, the, as far as setting the device up. Now, setting the device up is, is obviously going to be done by what I, the, the DME provider. And there is a method to get into the device, what we would call provider mode versus user mode. We do not want the end user, the patient, being able to get in there and change uh, pressure settings, change 
humidity levels, we want that to be from a clinical standpoint, so we keep that patient locked out of the device. So you don't ever want to tell a patient, you know, necessarily the, the way to get into the device. However, our, our device is all with just a little simple wheel, okay? Once the device is set, patient can look over at any particular point in the time of night. If they can press a button down, they can turn the unit on, okay? Just one click on, one click off. Very, very easy process there. Now, if they're going to, if, if, you are talking with someone about setting the device up. There is a, on the display screen, it has icons that say therapy, C-Flex, which we talked about was the expiratory relief earlier, some info, which would be compliance data, and then you've got the setup itself, okay? You would actually hold the wheel of the device down along with what's the ramp button. The ramp button is the button just below to the right of the, uh, of the wheel, and if you'll hold those down, for about seven seconds, if you're ever in a patient's home and you're talking to a physician, then it will cl click and allow you into the setup mode. Okay, so when you hear it beep twice, you are in the setup mode, and you would just simply scroll and click setup. At that point, you would be able to scroll over the mode of therapy. You would be able to scroll over the different pressures that are there, um, whether it be on the C-Flex that we talked about or straight CPAP and as well as some of the humidity settings would be available there to you as well, okay? So if you ever have to get into, into the device at all, you would simply scroll to the setup, hold the wheel and the ramp button down approximately seven seconds, that would get you into the, into the setup mode, okay? Ramp, you have a patient that's calling at night. We, we mentioned the ramp button just there to the, to the right of the wheel, and a patient is experiencing issues falling to sleep at night on the pressure, okay, even with C-Flux, even that we talked about the, the pressure relief. The ramp button will allow, let's say you're at 10 centimeters of water pressure as your prescribed setting. The ramp may let you set that at four centimeters, okay? And at four centimeters over a five, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 45 minutes in five minute increments, we'll step up to that patient's set pressure, okay? So what does ramp do again? Ramp allows you to go to sleep at a lower pressure while ramping up to your prescribed setting, okay? And a physician would be able to see once again from the compliance report that, okay, wait, if we're starting so low, are we having, are we having events as the patient falls asleep at, at what's called sleep onset? Which would lead me to another feature, though, of the auto CPAP device and why the auto CPAP is, is so successful. We added, because of that, what we call an OptiStart feature, okay? On an auto CPAP device, we talked about earlier that we have ranges. We have what we call EPAP minimum and EPAP maximum pressure, okay, in positive airway pressure, okay? And what it needs, so it's going to adjust between those two settings throughout the night based on the patient's needs. So you've got it set from 4 to 20 centimeters, but yet the patient's averaging, you know, 12 over a two-week period, over a month period, whatever it may be. So what we want to do with OptiStart is we've seen events happen earlier in the night, so we want to start meeting them more at that 12 centimeter pressure instead of all the way down at the 4. So what we're going to do is take about a third of that and begin creeping up a little higher to, to 12 so the patient does not have those events at sleep onset. Okay? And that's something that the physician will discuss with them as well at, at, their, at their setup time. We also have in these devices as well what we call advanced event detection. Okay, why would advanced event detection be important? Well, we can actually go out and see waveforms. We can see a patient's breathing patterns to see if they're experiencing an obstructive, again, a central apnea, apopnea, periodic breathing, whatever else it may be. How do we do that? We actually send a test pulse to the airway. So when we see a reduction in flow, we will send a small test pulse to the airway to see if we can get pressure through. Pressure meets an obstruction. We've obviously seen that we, see we have an obstructive apnea. If we see two of those in a row, we will begin to respond to that and raise pressure. If we don't get any, you know, so if we send a pulse and we get air through, we see that as a central event, central sleep apnea, more of the neurological related issue that, that someone may have and we're not going to respond to that. We're just going to record that and allow the physician to know in case he needs to go into any other, any other mode of therapy. 
Okay. The um, so that's the and then how do we respond? We talked about that, and we talked about Encore Anywhere data management. Now, I wanted to talk briefly about the um, the different educational tools that are available to not only to, to you and your patients as well. Because of the very thing that, you know, national average of CPAP compliance is still somewhere in, in the 50% range. However, we have seen if we get a patient more engaged, patient caregiver in their therapy, we saw a 22% increase in compliance using this sleep mapper application. We saw literally almost an hour and a half longer a night use with a patient using the sleep mapper application as well. Why would the sleep mapper application be important? Well, patient goes into a for a sleep study. They connect it with a lot of wires. A lot of different things are going on. Can be a little bit overwhelming. They get the results of their their test, and someone writes an order for for a sleep therapy device. Still don't really know exactly what they're getting that sleep therapy device for. What is apnea? What what, what really? happens. You say I have interrupted sleep. Well, I have interrupted sleep when my phone rings at night or the cat jumps in the bed or you have a child that comes in. There's several different things that could be considered un, you know, interrupted sleep. What we want to do with, with Sleep Mapper is show the basic things of what goes on <coughs> during an apneic event. You know, as we see that cessation in breathing, then we see you know, limited or no oxygen being delivered to the brain. Can you imagine what limited to no oxygen being delivered to the brain for at least 10 seconds to be considered an apnea, but possibly longer, could do to the body long-term ramifications of what that could do to the body. What happens at that particular point in that time, we have what we call sympathetic nerve activation, kind of fight or flight response. It's nice when it's there to save our lives. If someone's coming in and robbing a bank, you might want to know to run out the back door. That is that fight or flight, you know, stuff, but when it happens through your sleep and your body has a sympathetic discharge on and on and on every time that you're having one of those apnea events, it's putting a lot of stress on the heart. It's putting a lot of stress as you're not getting oxygen. Your body's getting a lot of uninterrupted sleep. You may feel like you slept eight hours, but you still wake up with that high CO2 retention and headaches that you may experience. So I'm going to, to briefly log in to this sleep mapper application. And I want you guys to know as well, sleep mapper application is a, it's a free service that's available to the patient. The DME provider would set the patient up on sleep mapper or the patient if they're already, if they're on the device, they have the device at home, they could set themselves up on sleep mapper. And what do you have to have to set up yourself up on sleep mapper? It is an email address. It is the serial number of the device, and you'd establish your own password. Okay? With that, you simply go to www.sleepmapper.com, www.sleepmapper.com, and set yourself up a login. In a lot of cases, there are DME providers that are going out there today and setting the patient up on that as well. You also have the ability through Sleep Mapper to, if you have a SD card slot on a PC or any device at home, if you log into your Sleep Mapper account, it's tied back to our Encore system that we talked about earlier that the physicians reviewed and the DMEs reviewed to get the data. You could literally upload your report directly to that physician as well through the Sleep Mapper application. Okay? Let me try to re reverse my steps there for a second. Through the Sleep Mapper application, with the ability to put in an SD card, much like you may put family photos or whatever else it may be, you log into Sleep Mapper. Once you've logged in the, the initial time, you download an installer. It takes about two minutes. From that point forward, it recognizes that card when you plug it into the to your PC and will transmit that over to Encore Anywhere. Okay? So with that being said, you may have transmitted that data to the physician's office, and when you get there, they may already have access to it. Don't want to take away the fact that we want to have the safety mechanisms of taking our device in but it may be something instead of them having to take your card and taking the additional time that the information may be there. Okay, so I will log in to the application. Okay. And what a patient would see upon logging into their uh, application 
and why we think it would keep someone motivated. Um, you, say you're working on a very large department. We all get competitive for, for different reasons. Hey, how are you doing versus, you know, how am I doing? Is your exercise program going well? Is your diet program going well? What, whatever it may be. Well, with this, what a patient would see is, how did I sleep last night? How many hours did I sleep? Did my mass fit very well? And what does my apnea apopnea index look like? Okay. Well, I want to go over to my buddy and, hey, look, look, I'm, I'm doing that much better. I slept seven hours on my device last night. I'm going to get a, a lollipop today or whatever else it, it may be. But it just gives them an idea of what's going on to get them a little bit more engaged in their therapy. And that's just on their very home page. And they could literally, if they had the iPhone or an iPad, they could take it into a physician and show them this information right at their, right at their fingertips. Now, but the main, the, the most important part about this application is learning. Is learning again what happens to an apneic event? What happens to a patient that may have heart related issues and it's untreated? What may happen to a patient that has diabetes? And leaving that diabetes, how sleep could, could impact that? Patient that may have hypertension. So if you click on the learn tab, and you guys could also, uh, it, it, at home and then when you're working with your patients, if you want to log into this application and have some of these videos at your fingertips, simply log into the www.sleepmapper.com, use the login. It's a demo login. It's just app, A-P-P, demo, D-E-M-O, at email.com, app, demo, at email.com, and the password is ABC123, okay? And in that case, if you get a question that comes from a patient, you could log in from your respective area and see videos. We're looking right now is, you know, what is OSA? What, what happens during a, to an obstructive sleep apnea period? We have others that people that have had issues with their therapy. How have they overcome it? How do they live with it? Um, and what are the various treatment options? You know, if the CPAP or the auto CPAP that, we're not, that we've talked about today is no longer the proper device based off the patient's condition, what are the other options that are out there? And I think Meredith mentioned earlier one of them, BiPAP, and, and we'll talk about that, that shortly. They, so there they're learning a little bit more about apnea in general. Okay. Then they could come out and learn a little bit, I want to get acquainted with my device. I got set up at a home care provider this morning at 8 a.m. and it's now it's 10 p.m. and I'm going to bed for the first time tonight. I have no idea what someone said to me this morning at 8 a.m. That is gone and I'm ready to go to bed, but I can't connect my device any longer. If they have the ability to log on to the internet of, of any sorts, then they could come in and out there and they could review a device guide. The device guide would step them through a lot of the stuff that we went through earlier of the hands-on of the device, of the humidifier, cleaning that, taking apart, putting it back together, and so forth. Okay? So that would simply be underneath device guide. Oh, just jumped right out. Then they would also have the ability to become acquainted more with their mask. A lot, a lot of people blame compliance-related issues on masks. And is the mask important? Absolutely. It's, it's very important. However, a lot of times they are adjusting to the pressure as well, and, and so the mask becomes the easy, easy target. I, you know, we, we always laugh and say, you know, nobody really says they want to grow up to be their dad like their dad because their dad wears a CPAP mask. That's not necessarily the goal. However, because their dad is healthier and living a better lifestyle, active and playing with them, it is pretty cool that dad's all of a sudden got the energy to go out and do the things that he could not do before he got rested sleep. So you would see with the mask guide, you would see again how to put the mask on, disconnect, and we'll go over that you know, here live today. It, it just gives them a little bit of better idea of, because you would be surprised that the, the things will get, that they get put on backwards, headgear clips don't get done. It's not normal. It's not something that you've done all the time, and you know, and and with a with a parent that is working with a child who says, "Gosh, I really didn't really didn't want this child to have to be on a CPAP device at this particular point in time." How can we make them more comfortable, them more secure with that? And this is a good way to do that because that you know they'll go into panic mode night one because the 
the child may be fighting them to put the device on, and if you don't know how to do it, you've already set yourself up for, for some problems that may happen. Okay? And then in there, you would see an introduction to, to whatever mask that you have chosen. You would see cleaning instructions on that mask. And we would suggest that a patient clean that mask on a daily basis, just simply due to the oils and the, the buildup that you may give. The, eventually, they'll lose their ability to seal. The headgear would become more stretched. And it becomes stretched. It's obviously falling off, keeping it on the nose, and, and keeping a good seal. So if you can advise to just clean that, that's just you know warm, soapy water. But make sure that you get the, the soap rinsed out, because sometimes the soap could build up, and that could cause some irritation. If you don't do that, I leave that sitting out for the day. So that would be something that you would do first thing in the morning and leave that sitting out. But there's some cleaning instructions on this site, and for time purposes today, we won't go into to great detail there, but it is available through this site. Um, there are cleaning instructions for the device. We talked about cleaning the, the water chamber earlier. You just want to really, as far as the device is concerned, it's just something simply wiping it down, keeping it clean, much like you would any other you know, household item that you may have at home, dusting, things like that. Um, and then with the device as well, though, in cleaning that, you will have here in the back, and it is small, you will have a little filter, the pollen filter that's in the back of the device. This would be something that uh, I would say on a weekly basis the patient would want to clean. Can you imagine why you would want to clean this? Sometimes you look at our various nightstands and we all realize that we need to do some dusting occasionally. And that dust could be coming into the device and if that dust builds up into your filter here, can the filter pull the proper pressure, I mean the filter, can the device pull the proper pressure that it needs in order to deliver what to, to the exact right amount to keep that airway open, okay? So it's just, this is just be a warm soapy water thing, so it's nothing real big, just, just pull that out rinse it off and, and eliminate that dust. And it slides right back in, it's in the very back of the device. So for some reason or another, they look at the back of the device just below where the SD card was. If that is no longer there, then we wanna make sure that they do get that filter, you know, put back in their device and, and check with their home care provider um, regarding replacing that. Um, there, there are instructions on here, too, how to travel with the device, kind of what we talked about earlier. Remember I said when the device, a lot of times they would carry it with water in the chamber? Well, that was a lot of problems coming back with water getting into the machine. We have protected from that. doesn't mean that we want to tell the patient they can now carry water in their device. We want to make sure that they, they do eliminate that if at all possible. And then the key thing is troubleshooting issues. So... I'm having mass leaks and I've gotten home and I don't remember what the DME provider said or the DME provider said, hey, it fit pretty good when I left, but I don't remember how to adjust that. Then this would help the patient with those mass leaks. You would also remember we talked earlier about increasing humidification and when and where. There's information there available to you and to the, to the patient on increasing humidification. If they have nasal discomfort, how do we deal with that? Because a lot of times people say, you know, you go get a pair of tennis shoes and you tighten your tennis shoes because you don't want them loose and you don't want them to fall off. What's well, the opposite with a mask? And everybody thinks, hey, if it's got straps, they need to be as tight as they can possibly be and it's pressed up against the face causing, you know, pressure and sores and things that are just not very comfortable. It almost feels like a bee is stung you on the top lip sometimes. Not very comfortable feeling when you're trying to sleep at night. And also, what happens is the flaps on the various masks will actually turn under the more it gets tightened, and that's where we actually have more leaks to occur, okay? Tighter is not better is what I would advise your patients. And always try to fit the mask and adjust the mask while they're lying down. Because if you think gravity is going to take over while you're sitting straight up, you're going to tighten the mask a little bit more, and therefore once you get home, it'll be a little tighter. If you get the mask maybe in a, in a spot that you like it and you're comfortable with, your shoes fit just right, take a marker, permanent marker, and maybe put a, put a mark on the headgear so is it, you know, if, it were to, if you take it apart and clean it or whatever it may be, then you know the spot to actually come back to every single time and you're not trying to readjust that on a, on a nightly basis. Um, a lot of times we will get pressure on the bridge of the nose, okay? With pressure on the bridge of the nose, there are various things that are out on the market 
today, and we've tried to eliminate those as a manufacturer, but there are things that they could go to the uh, DME provider for, and it's just called a nasal soft pad. It simply just lays over the bridge of the nose, and as that mask presses down, you usually see this when someone's wearing a full face mask. Okay, for whatever reason, full face mask puts a little bit more pressure on the bridge of the nose, and this may help eliminate some of that discomfort. We should be able to avoid this in, in most cases, though, by not tightening that mask down too much, but in some cases you may still see it, so there are options available you know, for the patient to, to do that. Lots, sometimes patients will get uh, irritation in the nares if they're using what we call a nasal pillow device, and we'll go to that. And there are some nasal gels uh, that are out there on the market available to them, not very expensive, but if you're experiencing nasal irritation and you want to give up on your device, uh, don't give up so quick and you may find some other solutions that will help you to, to do that. Um, it talks on here about how to manage your tubing. Uh, it talks about the ramp settings that, that we went over earlier. You, you have this tube and it, the tube would be connected to your mask. So a lot of times here, if you are sleeping, you may get, could get tangled up in your tube. So a lot of times people may want to run that over the headboard or something to get that or however what is the best to try to get that behind them and out of their way. They put it underneath the covers and maybe they're, you know, kind of snuggling up with it anyway and it's not that much of an issue. But you may want to suggest that they run that over the, the back of the bed. Ramp settings again, if they're experiencing issues at night, decreasing humidification, there's pressure on the forehead. There are forehead pads, and I'll get to that when we look at the mask, that if you tighten those down too much, I mean, you can think if I've got anything clamped to my head, that it could cause you some headaches there and cause some, you know, undue stress. We can make sure that we eliminate that. The pressure, the forehead pad should just be gently pressed to the head, not, not necessarily tightened to the head. Uh, there's some stuff on strap marks, things, things such as that that are available, okay? You can also come out on, on a sleep mapper application and set goals for the patient. So if a mother or, or father caregiver wants to set goals and they want to get that information back to their any electronic device that they have, the DME provider could set goals that say, hey, I want to use it for four plus hours a night for a week straight. And we actually send back little trophies to the to the device that they have achieved that might be a great way to to motivate a child to say, hey, look what you've, you've won a trophy today because of your therapy and, and reiterating how, how important it is for them to be able to use that. So you'd be surprised on how that has made a difference with people. That, that's whether it's children or adults. Adults are probably worse than children sometimes in that particular <laughs> case. Um, there is a coaching video, okay? So coaching, if I again had a risk of heart failure, then I may want to go out and look at a video and see how untreated sleep apnea affects my heart. I may want to go out underneath this uh, feelings tab and it says, let me come out here and change my answers and show you. I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this video, but I will try to play it because, and I'm a major fan of this because it shows a gentleman having an apneic period and it's something that most people can relate to. Not everybody can relate to what might be going on with their heart in untreated sleep, but everybody can relate to the, the family member that's in the chair at Thanksgiving or wherever else it may be, and he's snoring and he's gasping. You know, he begins to choking, gasping for breath, and, and starts to, that process continues on and on throughout the night. So what you can actually do, patient could come out, click on the 60-second video. See how this man's chest rises and falls while he inhales and exhales easily. An apnea episode is about to occur. During this time, at least 10 seconds or more may pass. He'll receive limited or no oxygen until his brain alerts his body to take a breath. apnea 
who do not use their CPAP device may repeat this same experience over and over throughout the night. Could this be you? The home care providers in, like to show this video, it, it's set up. Because again, I've gone through a sleep study, a lot's gone on. I show up to get my CPAP device set up and I really don't know exactly what I'm getting. And I really don't know why, in a lot of cases, I'm getting the device. I, somebody told me I snored. Okay, well, a lot of people may snore. Um, but when you show this video, I think people can relate to, as you see the chest, as you see the inhale and the exhale, and you see the gentleman as he begins to try to, to breathe, but he can't get air through. So you think about that intrathoracic pressure that he has going on inside as it hits that obstructed airway. We don't have blood flow going properly. The heart can't blow. Blood backs up to the heart. There's a lot of different issues. You'll see some insulin resistance due to that. So the body just can't function properly because it's not getting the proper oxygenation and blood flow that it needs. And that is a video that most people can relate to. You may also talk to the family, to, to the parent, caregiver. You're like, I really don't understand this. Well, yeah, a lot of times we say, well, hold your breath for 10 seconds. Hold your breath for 10 seconds and how does that actually make you feel? Uh, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I didn't feel very comfortable when that happened. Well, that's what's happening when your child is not using their device at night. That's the experience that they're feeling. So you may just you know, you may just su suggest to them exactly what's going on at night with their, uh, with their child. And we talked earlier about the uh, uploading the data to the, the different things. There is a settings tab that is on this, this site. If you come out and you click, you click data connection, underneath the data connection, you would have the ability to click on SD card and it would tell you how to get that, that to download that installer if you want to be able to upload the SD card. If you had a wireless modem, there's really nothing much that, that you have to do as a patient in that particular case. It, it would guide you through that process. It would also, if you're thinking about trying another mask and you want to see what other masks are out there, you just click on the uh, mask and you would change the selection and I'm sorry I'm not seeing exactly where that change is right now for whatever reason but you would change it what would pop up would be nasal a full face mask and a uh, nasal pillow mask as well okay all right so that's sleep mapper www.sleepmapper.com I cannot think of a better educational application that we have ever developed uh, through the company and I'll tell you, the study we recently did included 15,000 patients, and so it wasn't just a few patients, and we saw a 22% increase in compliance with that. We saw a, a three times more likelihood that a patient was struggling, that was struggling with their therapy to be compliant using Sleep Mapper versus the one that was not using Sleep Mapper. So you can see there's a lot of data that's available for them as well. I would also suggest one other site and it's, you know, most of it's at Sleep Mapper, but if you look at just simply sleepapnea.com, it will go through a lot of mask comfort and usage tips that are out there. It'll tell you how each one should work and some of the things that we talked about, about tightening the mask, um, things such as that. It actually talks about the mask not being crushed to the face, about putting the marker, that, you know, the headgear and things such as that. So it would give you a lot of information to be able to, to transmit back to, to the caregiver when you've got them on the phone. There's also a lot of uh, terms that are available. We talked about, you know, apneas today. We've talked about hypopneas. We've talked about central events. You want to go get more information or you want to go back and just review that, then the information would be there for you to discuss, allowing you to be more educated while you're talking to, to, that, uh, to that patient. Okay? So, Looking at the device, looking at educational information that's available on that, one more thing I would like to look at, because Meredith mentioned it also earlier, are the bi-level devices. Okay? So we've got CPAP, we've got the auto CPAP, and we've got bi-levels. Okay? 
you see a bilevel, you've got an inspiratory pressure called IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure. You've got an expiratory pressure, expiratory positive airway pressure, okay? What you would do with a BiPAP is a lot of times the, the lower pressure would be the, the EPAP pressure. The higher pressure would be the in, IPAP pressure. Sometimes you don't. You need a little bit more possibly on the in, inhalation side and maybe a little bit less on the exhalation. So what you will see is patients that need pressure support. They need a little bit lower pressure to also to breathe at against exhalation is you would set a device that say you'd have 12 centimeters of water pressure on the inspiratory and eight on the expiratory side. And it would go between 12 and eight on every, so on the expiratory, it would deliver eight the whole time and then it would come up on the inspiratory side to 12. You normally see BiPAP be effective in most cases at about above 13 centimeters of water pressure. Usually kind of the line in the sand there. A lot of times patients just don't feel as, as comfortable and compliant. Um, at, as those pressures get a little higher, okay? So that's just straight BiPAP pressure. We then have two other devices that are available out there as well, and one of them you may or may not have heard of is called BiPAP AVAPS. BiPAP AVAPS stands for Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. This technology has been used uh, quite, quite, quite frequently at Children's Hospital in Birmingham, and what you may have is a patient that experiences some sort of neuromuscular disorder, could be kyphoscoliosis, some sort of respiratory insufficiency, could be someone being heavy and the weight, they've got so much weight pressing down on their diaphragm that they cannot move the diaphragm enough to get the oxygen in and get the CO2 out. So we need to help them augment that tidal volume, okay? So what AVAPS, what it would actually do is it would let you set an ideal tidal volume based off a of patient's ideal height and weight. And this is a calculation that the physicians would, would set. And what the device would do is it would deliver an EPAP pressure to make sure, because EPAP is ma making sure that we keep the airway patent. We keep it open from any obstructive events. We would then use the pressure support to deliver that tidal volume and allow the patient to get that, that oxygen CO2 retention because we can get the airway open but if we still can't move the diaphragm enough we can't get the air down into the, the sacs of the lung and get that proper gas exchange. So what AVAPS does is, and it's a form of non-invasive ventilation and it allows you to, to augment that tidal volume for those neuromuscular. So what you see with AVAPS is a lot more of a respiratory related issue in most cases. You may have 25-30% of that patient population that still experiences obstructive but in most cases it is a respiratory patient for the most part experiencing there. Then you have what's called auto SV and that is auto servo ventilation. We talked earlier about heart failure patients and heart failure patients experiencing the waxing and waning breathing pattern known as periodic breathing and or Shane Stokes respiration. You also see that heart failure cause central events to occur. Okay, Central events is again the brain not sending a signal to the body to breathe. There is no airway obstruction. What a auto servo ventilation would do is it would, patients don't really have any lung related issues with auto SV. It's more of a, again, it's back to a neurological, auto SV neurological AVAPS, more of a respiratory related thing. And what it's going to do is it's going to deliver, it's going to say how much air can this patient move over a four minute window. And it says, okay, here's their target peak flow, basically kind of a tidal volume, if you will. And we want to make sure that we achieve that volume on each breath because that's what's ideal for that particular patient. So we, every time, if we see them drop below that four-minute target, we will deliver enough pressure support to get them back to it. So when they're having that periodic breathing or Shane Stokes, we make their wave, their breathing pattern to be much like normal breathing, get them back to the normal process. Then when their body throws the central events, Central events, again, so we set up what's called a backup rate. So how many breaths per minute do we want that patient, is that patient breathing at? The standard out there, you may see 12 breaths per minute. So if a patient does not breathe in a five-second window, the device is going to kick in a backup breath because, again, remember, neurological did not send a signal to the brain to breathe. We need to remind you breathing is a good thing, and we will kick in that backup breath to, to get the patient to breathe. Where is the backup breath determined? In most cases, you will see that determined from the sleep study. They look at a patient's spontaneous breathing 
as they get ready to go to sleep so they get a good idea of how many breaths per minute that they're breathing and they try to just back a, a little bit below that. Uh, now we in this particular device have a auto backup rate. So that auto backup rate would hover somewhere between I'd say 10 to 16 breaths per minute depending on the patient's needs and that's constantly reworking itself throughout the night. So it doesn't necessarily in, our, in that case have to be at a set pressure because we saw that being a, a moving target a lot and have been able to, to adjust just that. Um, so we've, we've covered now, we've covered CPAP, we've covered auto CPAP, we've covered BiPAP, and we've covered AVAPs again for your, your respiratory patients that are experiencing any, you know, neuromuscular related, and we looked at auto SV uh, advance for the more of the neurological related patient. I want to also let you guys know that there are some other things that are out there, programs that are available. We have a program called the Flex Promise Program, okay? What a Flex Promise Program means to your patient is that in that 90 days of compliance, let's say it's the 90 days, if a patient's not compliant on that therapy and needs to move to another mode of therapy, again, remember earlier I said BiPAP was 13 centimeters, kind of sometimes you get some pressure intolerance. So they need to go from a CPAP to a BiPAP because they just can't be comfortable. We will reimburse them that towards the BiPAP so the DME provider can take that back, send that back in. But it has to be in that 90-day compliance period. Something that you, you, know, you just need to know yourself and, and discuss that back. Ask the patient how long they've been on it and then discuss that with the, and have them discuss that with their home care provider. We see a lot of compliance being improved using the C-Flex technology so therefore we try to stand behind it and, and help them if they have to move to, to our higher technology. We also do what's called a 30-day satisfaction on our mask, okay? A lot of times it is something new, so if a patient goes out on a mask and in the first 30 days they are not comfortable with that mask, we will work with them and it, to move to another mask and replace that in the first 30 days, okay? So that is a 30-day satisfaction program to help people get started on their therapy that may need, hey, those shoes that their, that their mother or their grandfather or whoever else wore, a mask is not a pair of shoes, okay? So just because your daddy wears one mask does not mean that it's going to be that way for you. So you need to, to adjust accordingly. All right? So it talks about a little bit some of the programs that, that we have available. There are also, and if any of you need that out there and we can help supply, there are provider manuals. These are part number manuals that we could make available that would help you with some of the therapy modes that you need to get in or some of the things that you may be able to, to adjust for the patient as well. So that could help you in your guiding and management of the patient. Now, what I wanted to look at uh, briefly is some of the masks. Okay, with, with these masks, we have, uh, and I'll just go from the most, the least obtrusive and on up the line here, we have nasal pillows here, and these are just prongs that go into the base of the nares, probably the least obtrusive mask that you're going to, to have out there. The, what we recently did with this particular mask called the Nuance uh, Pro is instead of patients who experienced a lot of problem, again, remember earlier we talked about nasal gels and things that, 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 uh, that you may be able to put into the nostrils because there's vibration in the nose at times as that pressure goes, which causes irritation, okay? With this, these divide, this mass allows those, those cushions to sit just barely at the base of the nair, not up in it. It's got a ring that goes around that blocks it from getting too far up into the nostril, so sitting at the base so you can get that least obtrusive feeling and not get that vibration and some of that irritation to occur. We also have with this particular, if, if you get patients, they, you know, a lot of times they'll say that the headgear is sliding up their head. Make sure that they get that in the very back, down as far as they possibly can, below, below the little idiom here. And we've also added a non-slip headgear. So it should not, if you get it down there, you should not see that slide up anymore. We also talked earlier about the tubing, the management of the tube and where it may go. Well, you have a slot here in the headgear that you could put the tube through and run it back up over the top and behind the patient as well. Okay, so that may help them be a little bit more comfortable. You got the gel pads here to, to keep it soft on the face. But the key thing is light pressure 
sitting at the base of the nair, not up in the nair. And there's also little sizing gauges and they may just have go back to their DME provider that basically is just placed at the base of the nair. And you want to make sure that it fills the entire nair. So you want to get it. You may in this particular case, in some, you know, you may size up a little bit. So if they're experiencing air-related issues leaking around that, you may send them back to their DME provider and talk about another, uh, another size pillow. Okay, and actually, uh, with that mask, all the the pillows actually come in the bag anyway. So if there was a fitting issue with one, they could they could swap out to the other. And if you do that. You just simply peel that right off the mask, and it's kind of got a little triangular hub here. You just make sure that you pop that right back on so the patient can do that without necessarily going back into the DME to, to do so. Okay, so let me tell you this. A lot of patients and, and probably kids and, and caregivers of kids think that they won't nasal pillows because it is the least obtrusive. But as they begin to put things into their nares and pressure blows to their nares, it's not the most gratifying one that they can actually use at that particular point in time. So they will move over to a nasal mask. A nasal triangular mask is probably the most prominent of anyone out there. You just tend to see a little bit better compliance with, with the style mask. And a lot of patients will also say that they breathe through their mouth. Well, they breathe through their mouth because of their nair being obstructed. If you breathe here and it doesn't have an obstruction, you need to go to the second alternative, which would be breathing through your mouth. So they say, hey, gosh, I need something to cover my mouth. Not necessarily. Once you clear that obstruction and you begin to breathe through your nose again and get used to it, then your mouth will close up and you will no longer need something to cover. So you would be better off if you, can, if you can tolerate the nasal and get used to it, I believe that you will train yourself to keep your mouth shut. The good Lord intends for you to breathe through your nose, not your mouth. And when you do that at night, you look at an infant, that's, that's exactly how that would, would go. Okay? Now, they size these at the home care provider to find out which one covers the nares the best. In the nasal world, we want to be as small as possible without obstructing the nares. So if they've got a mask that's getting really wide out on their face, it's going to cause leaks to occur. Small as possible without obstructing the nares. So with this, we would just want to be from one side of the nair to the other, and this butts simply right up to the base of the nose and tells you exactly where you would fall in that particular case. So the home care provider would make their decision you know, based off that, and that would actually be in the bag, so if you've got home and you thought you were borderline and you wanted to make any changes, you, you could do that as well. But to tell you why a mask um, like this may work, uh, what we've gone to with this style mask is what we call auto sill technology. Why would we use auto sill technology? Well, we want the pressure of the CPAP to create the seal, not that you've tightened down your, your strap so tight and the cushion actually, again, as I stated earlier, could fold under. This would be just gently pressed to the nose, not in at all. You just let it sit basically touching the face. The pressure of the CPAP is going to pull that to the face. If you have this too tight, you will feel like you cannot breathe, push the mask off your face. So again, if a patient says they're having a hard time breathing against certain masks, it may be that you, know, you just simply need to loosen that mask just a little bit, and they may be able to exhale a little bit better on that. But the, the ability to, to, to bring that with the pressure has, has been great with compliance. And then we move over to full face mask. Okay? Now a lot of times you will see a full face mask used in a sleep study because a sleep study, let's remember, is one night. And in that one night, they're trying to get the most optimal pressure, and they do not know whether you're going to be a mouth breather or what you may experience. So instead of running in and out of your room several times, a technician waking you up, they may try to put on a full face mask to get that titration. Does not mean that you have to have a full face mask when you get home. You got 364 days to use it, you got one night in the sleep lab. Remember that they do not necessarily correlate with one another. Okay? 
we talked earlier about pressure on the bridge of the nose. Okay? Well, there is a, and on most full face masks that are out on the market, most of them have something called a glider that would pull that off the, the bridge of the nose. So if you are talking to the patient, you may ask them, do you have your glider, your dial, whatever terminology that, that they may understand, is it completely pressed in? And if it's completely pressed in, I would maybe look at trying to get them to, to simply just depress this and then others, others out on the market have dials, and that'll pull that off and give some pressure off the bridge of the nose. However, the dial is also designed to eliminate leaks. So if you've got the mask seated down around the bottom of the mouth and you're trying to eliminate a leak in the eyes, you may bring this in because it would tilt better there eliminating that leak. It is the last resort to eliminate a leak, however. Because if you can get that leak set up, you know, eliminated without trying to do this, your patient is going to be that much more comfortable. So how would you do that? Well, with that being said, you've also got, you've got the little clips here. And a lot of says, you know, what's the best way for someone to put that? I like to put that underneath my middle finger, place it to the here, and just simply get to the face. A lot of people may struggle trying to, I can't get this off. If they'll just set their hand in there, and just like they're cranking a car, turn the key forward, it would open open that as well. Okay, so patient would gently hold the mask to the face, if I'm tightened right, it's hard to see here, and then they would institute pressure laying back. If you had leaks, if you had leaks around the bottom part of the mouth, you would simply just press the mask in, Hold it, hold it where it eliminates those leaks and tighten the corresponding strap. Okay? We haven't touched the glider at this point. Then we would put some slight pressure, if it was leaking in at the eyes, slight pressure on the top and hold that pressure and tighten the strap accordingly. So the caregiver could have the child, whatever, hold that slightly and tighten that strap, keeping you from, again, tightening that down too much. It tends to see if you let the patient hold the mask and do it, they put it to a point that they're comfortable with and, you know, the pressure feels good to them versus someone else trying to tell them how that should be done. So you're going to have several different options that are out there. These are your most common. You've got, the, again, the nasal pillows mask. You've got the traditional nasal triangular mask. And you've got the full face mask as well. Most of these masks have the ability to interchange the cushions as well. So if a patient thought they did not have the right size, they could simply pop that out. Don't need to go back and get a whole other mask. They could just simply swap that cushion out and pop it right back in into the mask as well. There are, there are sizing gauges for this as well. The key thing that a patient needs to understand, and hopefully the DME provider would understand, is this sets just below the bridge here because we want this mask to actually kind of fall down, but we come right underneath the eye line and down in here into the crease. But a full face mask is used for somebody that's a mouth breather. So you don't fit them right there, you fit them down into the crease of the chin, because if they open their mouth, we need to make sure that the bottom part of their mouth does not fall out, creating those leaks. So I, it's very important for someone to use a sizing gauge a lot of times people think that they've seen so many faces that they know exactly what everyone's going to be, but you eliminate a lot of guesswork when you, when you do something like that. No different than going to a shoe store and having them use, use one of those as well when you've told them you're 10 and a half and you find out you're 11 in a shoe. So we have our, our different modes of, of therapy from CPAP, auto CPAP, BiPAP, we have our different masks that are available to you from the pillows to the nasal to the full face. And we have our different programs that are available to you. We talked about sleepmapper.com. We talked about sleepapnea.com. We talked about the ability for you to be able to log into sleepmapper to be able to uh, have some information to provide back to your patients. Um, those tools are so, so valuable. And anytime you can get your patients more engaged in their therapy and involved in their therapy, your chances to succeed are that much better. So that's all I've got today as far as CPAP, BiPAP, and mask. Please let us know if we could ever answer any questions for you guys, and uh, we appreciate you having us.
Thank you, Jackson. Thank you. That was very informative. I learned a lot. Um, we are going to switch gears now and go over real quick why is it that we're talking about this today? Well, Medicaid is changing their payment structure for how they're going to be reimbursing for these machines. And the DME company used to receive a monthly rental fee on the machine. And that has led Medicaid to, that was leading Medicaid to pay for the machine more than once over, basically. They would continue to pay this rental fee month after month. So they're going to change their payment structure in that the DME company will receive a rental fee for three months, and then in the fourth month, they're going to receive like a balloon payment that's going to cover the rest of the cost of the machine. Monthly payment um, will will cover the cost of delivery for the machine, the in-service of for the caregiver. So someone from the DME company is going to show up at the patient's house with this machine, get it set up, and run through how to take care of the machine. So everything that Jackson has just gone over with us, somebody will be doing with your patient. It is not the care coordinator's responsibility to do that. They'll go over maintenance, repair, and supplies. The approval period for the CPAP machines, the patient is required to use the machine for four hours per night for at least 50% of the nights in order for the DME company to receive reimbursement. This information is going to be downloaded from the machine to the DME company, and Jackson went over with us about how the SD card works and the possible modem issue as well. Um, the issue that some of the DME companies are running into is that the patient moves. Well, so when the patient moves, we've got to track down the machine. Well, that's where we come into play because we're, we're good at finding people. So that's one thing that the care coordinator, care coordinator might be doing is trying to track down these machines. So this is um, where we will definitely come into play is during this trial phase with the machine. So we need to encourage compliance with the machine. We want to be the cheerleader for the family and make sure that the child is using this machine. This, the child needs this machine, so they need to make sure that they're using it. So there's changes that can happen. Jackson went over these different masks that we have available. Maybe a different mask would help this child to be compliant. And I know that when he was showing those to us, all I could think about was trying to get a wiggling five-year-old into one of those. So you can imagine how challenging that would be. The care coordinator is going to need to communicate with the DME company to determine if the patient has been using the machine. The DME company is going to have that information. So the care coordinator will know when you're talking with the family how compliant the patient has been with the machine. The referral for this is going to come through the CCRS. It's going to include information about the DME company that is providing the machine. We're going to give you the name of the company and the phone number to the company. It's going to be imperative that you get in touch with the DME company and talk with them. The first thing you're going to do is contact the family to schedule a home visit. At Medicaid's request, an initial home visit is required on each patient. During the home visit, you're going to inquire about machine usage and any troubleshooting for any reasons why the patient is not being compliant with the machine. There are lots of reasons why the patient may not be using the machine. That mask can be very uncomfortable. Again, imagine putting that on a wiggling child. Maybe the machine got lost or stolen, or they're not sleeping in the home, or the machine's not in the home where the patient is sleeping. It can be loud. Um, it, I know that my husband's is not very obtrusive. It's a whole lot easier to listen to that than to the snoring. So it's not really loud, uh, but it can be an adjustment to get used to it. Um, okay. The, the, there's no power in the home or the power outlet is not near the bed. So maybe it's the, the problem that there's not a power source to plug that machine into. It scares the patient. Can you imagine having to wear that full face mask and maybe you're sleeping in the bed with a sibling? Well, that would be scary to roll over in the middle of the night and see that on your little brother or little sister. That, that could be kind of frightening. So that could be part of the reason as to why they're not using the machine and, and not wearing their mask. So you're going to need to ensure that the family understands that you will be in contact with the DME company to discuss any issues with the machine. Make sure you've got a release on file to speak with the DME company. We want to make sure that everything is on the up and up and that we've got all of our documentation signed. So you're going to contact that DME company 
and let them know, hey, I'm working with Jody Smith's family with their CPAP machine, and I will be going into the home and talking with them on a regular basis to see what type of issues they're having with the machine. So you can communicate with that DME company and bring the family into those conversations as well. It could be that you're referring the patient out to the DME company for some changes. That DME company is going to be helping you to establish um, if they need to change the mask at any time. The DME company can help you with that. So you're going to follow up with the family via phone call once a week after the initial home visit. So the first thing you're going to do is go out to the home and meet with the family in the home. This is where you can establish, is there an outlet next to the bed where they're placing the machine? Is there power running into the home? Those are going to be big factors that if we don't have power in the home, the machine's not going to work. So you're going to need to have weekly phone contact with the family during the first month. So you're going to get the referral and then you're going to go out to the home and do a home visit then you're going to have to have weekly contact with the family after that. If the patient is compliant with machine usage, the care coordinator will continue to contact the family via phone every other week until the case is closed. So you're going to continue to follow up with the family every other week if they're determined to be compliant. How are you going to know if they're compliant? Well, you're talking to that DME company. So it's a good idea for you to document in your notes who you're speaking to at the DME company. If the patient is non-compliant with machine usage, weekly phone contact will continue with the possibility of a home visit to follow up in order to encourage proper machine usage. So if they're not using that machine for the four hours a night for 50% of the nights, then they're not going to be compliant, which means you're going to need to do further follow-up with that family and continue to get in touch with them. After the fourth month, Medicaid is going to pay off the machine to the DME company, at which point the care coordinator will close the case unless further needs have been identified. How are you going to know that? Well, you're going to find out from us. The central office is going to be in touch with the, the, with Medicaid, and Medicaid's going to tell us to close the case. So then we'll be communicating that with you. Most likely that's where Melissa's going to come into play. So she'll be, she, she will be contacting you to let you know, hey, this case is, you can close this case now. The patient has been compliant. And then you can close out that case. All documentation will be completed in ACORN and reports to referring provider will be sent to a spreadsheet for data analysis. Um, in some of the other projects that we're working on, I'm finding that people have noticed that there's holes in their data on the spreadsheet. So the form that we've created in ACORN, which we're about to look at, we've got edits set up to make sure that you're entering all that information. So please make sure that you enter all of the information on the form in ACORN so we have everything that Medicaid needs. All of the information put on the report to referring provider will be dumped into that spreadsheet. We're going to be returning that data back to Medicaid on a weekly to monthly basis. The report is a selection of responses that you're going to click through. You're not going to have to type out a narrative. Uh, try to think about your ER report when you're doing those ER referrals for Medicaid, how we have that form set up to be a point and click. That's what this report has been set up as. It's crucial that all data fields are completed in order to provide accurate data to Medicaid. So let's take a look at the form. So we've got this set up in ACORN, and it's, it's just like your regular referral form. So on the Referred By tab, you're going to select Medicaid as your referral source. If you do not select Medicaid, the correct form is not going to generate. I get calls a lot of times from managers saying, hey, my worker's having a hard time getting the, the report won't come over. Why, why is that happening? I have also gotten calls from Medicaid saying, Meredith, we're getting this form faxed to us. Why is that happening? And I go in, and the very first thing I notice is their referral source is not Medicaid. So make sure that on a Medicaid referral that the referred by source is Medicaid. That way the proper form is going to generate for you. So who's our referring provider? 
Well, it's going to be Vivian Bristow. She's the person at Medicaid that is making these referrals. So you'll have to input her name. I believe we have taken the edit off for her fax number because the, the report's not getting faxed to her. So therefore, you don't have to input her fax number anymore. When I checked it on um, Wednesday, it, it wasn't required. So hopefully you won't have to put that fax number in. Once you put Medicaid in as the referral source, CPAP BiPAP is going to generate under the reason for referral tab. If you do not put Medicaid in as your referring source, CPAP BiPAP will not generate as your reason for referral. So make sure that that Medicaid is the referral source and CPAP BiPAP is going to generate for you. And that's what you're going to select as your reason. When you click that, once you have saved your referral form, then you're going to have the button for the report to referring provider. When you click on create report to referring provider under the summary tab, this is initially what it's going to look like. You're going to have to select if you've had patient contact. It starts out pretty blank. But once you select patient contact as yes, then you have to put what type of contact you've had. If you select no, different options are going to appear on the form for you to save it. If patient contact is no, once you click save, it's going to let you save the form. If patient contact was yes, but patient refused services, you'll be able to save the form and move on. However, if you have patient contact and you were able to get in touch with the patient, then you're going to be asked which type of machine the patient is using. This again will be given to you in your CCRS referral. We're going to tell you if they're on a CPAP or a BiPAP machine. When I looked at all of the referrals that we've got, the majority are going to be on the CPAP machine. That's the more common machine that we saw on our referral list. Also, you'll notice that view all for printing button. That way you can click on that button and it will show you all of the questions so that you can print this form out and have it when you're meeting with the family so you'll know what questions to ask. Once you select that you've had patient contact, the next button that you're going to have is the visit type. So you'll have to select if this was the initial visit, which is the home visit, or if it's a follow-up contact. You're going to select which visit is being documented. If it is a follow-up contact, complete the questions based on information gathered since the previous report. The questions are the same for either visit. You're going to have survey questions that you have to ask the patient. Each question is going to require an answer. We've given you an NA option if for some reason it does not apply. But please note that each question does require an answer. You're going to have to respond as to how much usage the patient has with the machine. Now, this is a little weird. When I played with this in the system, you can the little buttons on the side, when you click those buttons, it'll highlight the number. It's like, how many hours per night does the patient use the machine? Well, I scrolled and put four in, and then I went to the next one. And I tried to save my form, but it wouldn't let me. You have to click on it. So right now, you can see on there how the box is white with the zero in it. Well, when you scroll through and you put your answer in, you need to click on it. And when you click on it, it turns the number blue. It turns that box blue. That's saving your entry. So I, I know that I messed that up several times when I was playing with the form. So make sure that you turn that box to blue or else it's not saving your form. We try to think of some general reasons as to why the patient isn't using the form, the, the, the mask, I'm sorry, the machine. So we came up with several different reasons. And again, y'all, this can be scary for the child. So we put scares patient on there. That could be something that, that definitely comes up with children using this. It's uncomfortable to sleep with. Um, you can imagine having that tube going back over your head, and then you have this other long tube. Imagine trying to roll over. They're, they could get twisted up in that. So that can be a challenge for the child as well. So it can be uncomfortable to them while they're sleeping. There might be some troubleshooting that you have to walk through with the, with the family. Um, a lot of times, some of our patients are sharing the bed with somebody. Um, Gavin, my husband, is on the WISP, the middle one that Jackson showed us, and it shoots air out the top of it. 
Well, I was waking up. I was having this dream that air was blowing on me, and I didn't understand what was going on. I was like, okay, this is weird. And then I started to get colds. I was like, why am I getting a cold? I haven't done it. I've been in the office. Why am I getting sick? And I got to thinking about it, and when cold air blows on me, I get a cold. I get sick. So Gavin and I have what's called the barrier pillow. And so at night, we have a pillow that sleeps in between the two of us so that his air isn't blowing on me out of his machine. So y'all are getting way more information than you needed about my marriage. But um, so the, the you can come up with ideas to help them. So that's one of the things that you're going to have to do is talk to this family about why aren't you using the machine? What's going on in your home that's preventing this child from using it? And it could be as simple as they need a barrier pillow. Or maybe the, the child needs to be moved to the couch or someplace else to sleep so it's not scaring a sibling that has to share the room with the patient. The next section on the report to referring provider is going to be the interventions that you provide with the family. Make sure that you check all that apply. And there's several different things here. We tried to come up with lots of possibilities that could be things that the care coordinator does to help this family use the machine more effectively. And then our last section is if the case is open or closed. So you'll need to mark if the case is still open or if you've closed out the case. We always try to provide you with the text box at the bottom. But again, this is a report to referring provider that is being sent to Medicaid via a spreadsheet. So anything that you type into this box is going in the final column of a spreadsheet that they may not pull, they can't pull data out of that. So if you need to tell Medicaid something, then definitely type it into that box. But otherwise, the general rule is to place any information into your progress note. And another thing that um, Melissa brought up to me, which was an excellent idea, if your child is on a CPAP or BiPAP machine, they're needing that machine to breathe at night while they're sleeping. It might be a good idea to recommend to the family to get in touch with the power company, and there's a form that they can fill out that they have a life-threatening condition that requires them to have power to the home, and they'd be one of the, they'd be a priority patient or a priority family to get the power turned back on during a disaster. So I know during hurricane season, it's possible that the power is going to get knocked out. Well, if they're on a list with the power company, they would be one of the first families. They'd be a priority family to get the, the power turned back on. So in summary, the role of the care coordinator is to help with compliance issues. You do not have to determine the compliance of machine usage. The machine's tracking that for us. We do not have to do that. But we're there to help troubleshoot. Why aren't you using the machine? Again, compliance is determined as four hours per night for 50% of nights. The DME company is going to have that compliance information. You are not responsible for determining if the machine is being used four hours a night, 50% of the nights. Your contact with the DME company is going to be crucial. You have to be in touch with that DME company to understand if the patient is using the machine. These are going to be very intensive cases. You're going to have weekly contact with these families for a while. And then you're going to be talking to them every other week. That's a lot of contact with these families. But it's short in duration. The maximum amount you'll have this case opened is about four months. So they're going to be quick cases, but they're going to be intensive while you've got them. Um, I still have Jackson here for a minute or two more, uh, so if you have questions, uh, you're welcome to call in or email us with anything. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What is the youngest age someone can use this machine? That is an excellent youngest. question, and I will have to give that over to Jackson because yeah. I don't know what the youngest age a person can use the machine is. Well, it's not necessarily an age. It's more of a you know, size and, and, and weight limit that a patient, I want to say it's around, uh, that's what I don't know right off the top of my head, I want to say it's le like less than 50 pounds, I believe it is, somewhere in that particular ballpark. I'd have to get you exact figures on that, but from a child standpoint, I mean, we have them all the way down, you know, to the infant, so it's it's down to some to, to, to very small children. However, I think the, the problem that you have with that is any sort of uh, mass that may work to, to be able to take care of that. So it's not so much a, a device 
part so much as it is a, a mass related. Do we have any other questions? Mary? Yes, ma'am. Are the DME uh, providers aware that the care coordinators are going to be contacting them? Medicaid told me that they were going to be, they have like a, a monthly or quarterly meeting with the DME companies and they were going to be telling them that ADPH was going to be involved with these referrals and they were being alerted to the fact that we were going to be getting in touch with them. So actually I think this started with the DME companies wanting some help. So I think they're going to be very open to our care coordinators talking to them. They're pretty excited about having us involved. So uh, I, I hope you won't have any problems getting in touch with the DME company. Again, I would recommend recommend that you make sure you have a release on file to speak with the DME company and document your progress notes who you've been speaking with at the DME company. So if someone comes behind you to pick up that case, they'll know who you were talking with at the DME company. No emails or anything? No emails. Okay. All right. If y'all have questions, concerns, comments, please do not hesitate to call or email me anytime. I'm more than happy to help out with that. Um, these referrals, we're going to be loading them in most likely on Monday or Tuesday. They are statewide referrals. We are very excited about this new opportunity. So make sure that you're filling in all of your data so we can get that back to Medicaid. If you have questions, comments, or need anything, please do not hesitate to call or email me anytime. And I want to thank Jackson again for being here with us today. It was very informative. Thank so you for having me. Thank you all very much, and have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.